we know that in the wild animals use call systems. These, as we have seen, have some elements of language including cultural transmission and a very limited amount of productivity and displacement. Call systems are also arbitrary in that a call for a leopard doesn't have to sound like a leopard. Call systems also lack spontaneity in that calls typically require a stimulus first. It wasn't clear though in the first half of the 20th century whether apes could be taught to use English. One idea was that if a chimp was raised alongside a human baby, it could potentially learn to use English. The focus really was on environment. If it just had the right conditions, perhaps apes could learn to use language. An early attempt was with a chimp named Gua, who was raised alongside a human child named Donald. Gua was far ahead of her human counterpart in development and coordination as apes develop faster than humans. Language, however, was another story. Gua simply wasn't making progress, and when Donald began to pant hoot, the chimpanzee call for excitement, the experiment ended prematurely. A second attempt was made in the 1950s with a chimp named Vicky. Vicky was given rewards for her language progress. We'll see later that this coincides with the behaviorist school of thought in psychology. And her trainers tried to shape her lips to make the correct sounds, like mama, papa, up and cup. And these were really all the words that Vicky could pronounce, and even these words were not completely understandable. These early attempts were doomed from the start, because apes aren't built to speak in the way that humans are without even considering the question of whether their brains are capable of language. The morphology, or form, of the human vocal tract, from the larynx to the lips, is different than in chimps. In humans, the larynx, or the voice box as it's called, is situated further down in the throat, and this allows most of the air to pass through the mouth, or the oral cavity as it's called, where sounds can be articulated with the teeth and the tongue. In chimps, most of the air passes through the nose, and this does not allow for the articulation of sounds that are necessary for language. In the 1960s, a clever workaround to the differing vocal tracts of chimps and humans was discovered. Apes could be taught sign language. Sign language, as it turns out, is equivalent to spoken language in terms of the brain regions that are activated. If chimps could master sign language, it would suggest that chimps and other primates were not so different from humans in terms of language. The first chimp involved in these experiments was Washoe. She was taught ASL, or American Sign Language. Washoe learned about 200 words of ASL, and she also taught some signs to her adopted son, Lulis, which qualifies as cultural transmission. And it is said that she could refer to things not present, not in her immediate environment, which would qualify as displacement. Impressively, Washa was able to combine different signs to create new ones, including finger bracelet for rings. Evidently, chimps are very excitable and quite strong, presenting all kinds of problems for this type of research. Coco the gorilla who was a lot more subdued than a chimpanzee, became the new darling of ape sign language studies. She is reported to know anywhere from 400 to up to 1,000 signs of ASL and evidently creates her own sign in GSL, or Gorilla Sign Language. Reported conversations suggest that Coco could joke around, pretending to be a bird, which would qualify as displacement, or talking about something that exists only in the imagination. In other conversations, she could refer to things that had happened in the past. Again, another example of displacement. As astonishing as Coco is, Kanzi, the bonobo chimpanzee, another species of chimp, is even more amazing. Rather than ASL, Kanzi uses lexigrams, or block symbols, that are arbitrary. This is important because sign language is not always arbitrary in that 
it does resemble in some cases the things that it represents. Like children, Kanzi's understanding of language outpaces his ability to produce it, and he's even outperformed two-year-olds on linguistic tasks. Kanzi first learned lexigrams as his mother was being taught them, so kind of incidentally. At first, anyway, Kanzi had no formal training or formal rewards. In this regard, his language use was spontaneous very different than previous ape sign language projects in which the primates were given rewards for producing the correct sign. These projects suggest at least some capacity for productivity through hierarchy, putting smaller pieces together to make larger pieces, some capacity for displacement, spontaneity, and cultural transmission. The case is far from closed, however, Critics like Steven Pinker suggest that apes don't understand the rules of language in the same way that human children do, but by and large are simply responding to rewards. That is, ape language is an example of conditioned response, where apes receive a reward for language. We'll see how this contrasts with human language learning in later lectures. With the possible exception of Kanzi's first efforts, apes, as well as birds, require lots and lots of M&Ms, uh, primates have a sweet tooth, in order to use language. Even more damning is a chimp by the name of Nim Chimsky, named after Noam Chomsky. Herb Terrace wanted to prove the critics wrong about ape signing, especially Chomsky. Everything was going great for Nim and his signing until they actually sat down to analyze his sentences. Yes, Nim was able to refer to things in sign language, but his syntax or word order was totally random. It didn't look like Nim understood that more modified drink. He just knew, intelligent creature that he was, that if he made the sign for more, and milk in proximity to each other, then he would get his reward. Basically, he was imitating and his sentences were never spontaneous. This intelligence displayed by apes and some other animals may be what is resembling language. They have an astonishing ability to problem solve. The critics say that this ability is not the same thing as language. Importantly, Coco and Washo's utterances or sentences were never systematically examined and remain largely anecdotal. They remain stories. Kanzi, however, is under systematic examination and appears to be doing more complex things with language than any other primate. Another suggestion in terms of the critique is that apes were being prompted. Trainers would ignore wrong answers, critics often complained, and focus on correct answers. This is often called the clever Hans effect after a horse that was trained to count based on cues from his trainer. So the clever Hans effect is basically the idea that the ape trainers were giving cues or clues to the signs that were expected of them. So what can we take away from all this? Well it's pretty clear that apes are using reference the sign for chair appears to really mean chair. Other aspects of language don't seem to be there, especially things like word order. Utterances or sentences are generally not spontaneous, and most ape sign language projects have not been subjected to systematic study, which is also a really big problem. A moderate view espoused by many linguists, psychologists, and biologists alike are that apes have some building blocks of language, but they don't have the full-blown capacity for language, especially displacement and productivity, as is made possible by hierarchy, meaning made possible by putting smaller units together to make larger units.